say um, good morning. Thank you very much to all participants connected to this uh, training session and thank you uh, to our host institution, CITO, the Central Information and Technology Office uh, there in Belmopan, Belize. My name is Mike Mora and I'm an specialist with the Department for Effective Public Management of the Organization of American States. Welcome all to the four dedicated training in open data of the project promoting an open government ecosystem in Belize implemented by the Trust for the Americas and the Department for Effective Public Management of the OAS with the support of the Embassy of the United States of America in Belize. In this session, we will learn about the technical aspects of creating data sets, that is about how to open in data. As mentioned uh, in our last uh, training session, these uh, open data training sessions that we started are oriented to a reduced group of government officers that for the purpose of this project, we consider the Open Government Champions Network of Release. Our goal is to embrace, specialize, and develop skills in a dedicated group of officers to innovate, transcend, and improve public service delivery through open government. And, that, uh, and th with that, um, this group can become agents of change in doing uh, in doing so. So I want to thank you all for your attendance and commitment. Uh, please uh, let our local project uh, local project coordinator, uh, Mr. Henry Wake, who's connected, uh, is responding on the chat, and we're going to hear from him at the Q and A session about how to engage uh, with this project, uh, with this open government project. Um, as a reminder. For our Q&A session at the end, please prepare your questions and share them throughout the presentation using the chat tool of this platform. Uh, we will collect the questions and have them ready for the speaker once her presentation is done. So please do not hesitate. Send us your questions as, they, as, as, as you have them. Um, and uh, now, without further ado, I would like to present the speaker of the day. She's Camila Salazar. You, see, you can see her in... in, uh, in um, in the screen right now. Uh, she's a data uh, journalist and an open data activist from Costa Rica. Uh, she currently works uh, as a data trainer and consultant and as a data journalist professor at the University of Costa Rica. Uh, she previously worked in, uh, to investigate, uh, in the investigation unit of the La Nación newspaper in Costa Rica and other me media outlets in, in the country. Uh, so hopefully we can get a lot of um, uh, insight about the use of open data in this in this sector. In 2015, she uh, was a School of Data Fellow. Uh, this is an international project that works to empower cities, uh, civil society, organizations, journalists, and citizens uh, with the skills they need to use data effectively. She has been working with the international open data community ever since. So it's a pleasure to have you uh, in this session, uh, Camila. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in economics and a, a, another degree in journalism from the University of Costa Rica. So this is it on my side. Uh, welcome again, uh, Camila. I will have your uh, presentation up and running uh, now. Um, and I will say goodbye to my camera and let you lead the presentation. Uh, from this point and on. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mike, for the presentation and good morning, everyone. For me, it's a pleasure uh, to be sharing this session with you, and I hope that we can share a lot of experiences and learn uh, throughout this session this morning. As Mike said, um, I work as a, right now as a data trainer and consultant, and I've been working with the open data community for the last three or four years. And the idea of this session is uh, to explain to you some of the technical aspects on how to open data. Once you know the principles uh, and the, the characteristics that open data sets must have, uh, you might have questions on how do you implement these policies within your organizations. So the idea is um, that I will be, let me just, okay. The agenda of this session is basically to explain some data architecture basics, what are the principles that open data must have, and how the structure information looks like. Uh, also, I'm going to tell you about how to get and create or extract data uh, in your organizations in order to open it. Uh, a little bit about data cleaning and formatting. There are two really important steps throughout the open data process, and also about data interoperability. 
Um, as Mike said, I'm going to be talking uh, throughout this session, and if you have any questions, please write them down, and I will answer them throughout the session or uh, after after the presentation. Um, so, well, to begin with, we're going to talk a little bit about data basics, and I'm pretty sure that you might already, throughout this, this course that you're taking, um, you already have talked a little bit about what's open data. Uh, but it's important to 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 be clear um, on what's open data in order to explain all these principles and all these structures. So if you already know it, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to repeat it. So basically, open data is information which can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, anywhere, for any purpose. As that means that it has to be data sets that are available for free so that the users can just download it and create insights and knowledge out of this data that the government is producing. And, and open data has to have two specific things also. It has to be legally open and that has to do some that, uh, about some question that, that was stated um, before. Uh, that it has to be available under an open data license that permits anyone freely to access, reuse it, and redi redis redistribute it. And the idea of this is that if a user finds a data set online, uh, it has to be clear what he can or cannot do with this data. An example of this is, for instance, I remember that a few years ago, the National Institute of Costa Rica, uh, when you ask for a database, for example, of a national survey, you had to sign a document that says that you couldn't redi redistribute that database to anyone. You could just use it for your research purposes and you couldn't upload it online or anything. So this is something that we need to avoid when you make data sets available for the public and the public needs, needs, to be, needs to know for sure what he can do with the data. And at the end, I'm, I can show you a few links of licenses that I recommended uh, for open uh, for for open data projects um, that that help to avoid these each, these issues, and also open data needs to be technically open, and that means that it has to be available in a machine readable format. Uh, for example, there might be available information that's on paper, but in that case, uh, the reuse and redistribution of that data becomes quite difficult. So we have to make it accessible. Uh, on a digital format and a structured machine readable format. I'm going to talk about formats a little bit after. And also in bulk form. In bulk form, it means that uh, the entire data set must be available for download instead of just putting parts of the data set online. So, for instance, if you have the National Household Survey, you should uh, have the, the survey online available for download instead of just having tables about the number of households in poverty or specific variables and cross tables of that information, okay? So once we have these principles, uh, there is also uh, another list of principles that open data must have when we open it. And I took uh, a list here about uh, a list of principles uh, by the Sunline Foundation. Th there's a big list. I, I, I put what I believe are the most important. Uh, that you need to take into account when you're opening data sets. And the first one is completeness. completeness. Uh, and that means that data sets released by the government should be as complete as possible, reflecting the entirety of what is recorded about a particular subject. And as I said, this is related to what I was saying before about bulk format, that you need to try to put online all the information that's available and not just parts of it. So a good example of this might be, uh, for example, if you're the transport minister and you collect information about the companies that provide public transportation services, uh, you might collect information about the name of the company, its ID number, the number of routes, uh, the, the number of miles that it covers, etc. And if you put this database available online, you should make it available with all the variables that you collected and not just part of the information. The only parts of the information that you should exclude from a database are those subject to uh, privacy concerns. And about privacy concerns, this vary, uh, depends on the national legislation, um, but mostly it has to do with um, uh, subjects of national security uh, and private information, for example, health information, 
uh, or tax information, um, but it, it really depends on the national legislation. Um, so what I recommend is that you see which legislation applies uh, about access to information, and that you should remind uh, yourselves also that when it when it comes about public information and and, and information that public institutions produce, uh, pretty much all the information is public. Uh, even, for example, wages about public servants, because uh, at least in in some in, in most of the legislation, it's possible to publish this information uh, because it has public interest. So my recommendation is that you search uh, your national legislation regarding what information is private and which is not. Uh, the other principle that's important to take into account is primacy. And also, uh, this means that the data sets that you publish should be primary source data. Uh, and that means that uh, you have, uh, if you're an institution, you probably are going to collect information, uh, and the users need to know for sure how this information was collected and, and search for the original source of these documents. So to see if, to verify if the, if the information was collected properly and recorded accurately. Um, also, data sets should have easy access. Uh, and they should be as accessible as possible without barriers. And that should mean that it, downloading data sets from the government should be as easy as going into a website and just click on a link and download the database. You should avoid, for example, um, forcing the people to log in in order to download the information or explain why do you need this information. Uh, information should be accessible, as I said, to everyone without barriers. Um, and sometimes what before, for example, for me as a journalist, what happened before is when you needed information from a public institution, what you usually did was that you contacted the press uh, office of the, of, the, of the institution and you asked for that information and then this person would go and search for the information inside the institution. And the idea with open data is to get rid of all these processes that are time costly and just to make things easier for the final users. Right now, I just can go online and download the data set that I need for my research, for my story, um, for, for whatever use I want to I wanna give to the data, OK? Uh, also, as I said, information should be in a machine-readable format, uh, should be stored in widely used formats that are easily lend themselves to machine processing. I'm going to sp explain to you a little bit more about these formats, which are the most common. Um, and then means avoid PDFs, avoid paper files. You should try to, uh, to publish a structure and open information. And other two principles that are really important that you need to take into account is timely, timeliness and permanence. And timeliness is that the idea is that open data is only valuable if it's still relevant. So for instance, something that happens a lot with open data portals is that, for example, you have an open data portal and you publish data sets from 2015. And now we are in 2018 and this information hasn't been updated. So it's not that relevant anymore. Um, and the idea is that the government should publish information as quickly as it is gathered and collected so that it, it's still relevant for the final users. And permanence uh, means that it should be available online in archives in perpetuity. Uh, and that means that, for example, if you upload a data set, you should not delete it, delete it. And if you make changes to the data set, these changes should be recorded and let the user know why this information was uh, changed. For example, if you uploaded a data set and you discovered afterwards that it has errors, you can uh, delete it and upload a new one, but you should record that change. Uh, and that means that what, we're, what, we, what we try to do with these principles is that the users must know for sure what information is there, how fast is it updated, um, and, and know if there were some changes in the information. You shouldn't do these changes arbitrarily without letting the users know because uh, the final end is transparency with the final users, okay? Uh, so this, as I said, are, are some of the basic principles. And the idea is that when you're going to start an open data process, you should like list all those principles and see that your different data sets comply with these principles so uh, that they, that they uh, have uh, this, this open data formats uh, 
uh, and, and I have um, the needed structure in order to publish it. So, as I said, uh, we're, what we're interested here is in publishing uh, information in open data formats, in machine-readable formats, and there are a few formats that are widely used uh, when, when we see open data portals, and one of the most common is a file called CSV file, that it stands for comma-separated values, and it looks something like this. Uh, if you see here, for example, it says school name, comma, school type, comma, etc., etc., and that's how the variables are listed. If you import this file, for example, in a spreadsheet, in an Excel file, or in a Google Sheets file, it's going to look like, like a spreadsheet, like a structure file. And it's widely used as an open data format because it's free. You don't need a specific program uh, to open these files. So mo pretty much everyone can use it regardless of the programs or, or the information of, of the programs they have. They don't need a license to open CSV files because it can be read, as I said, in spreadsheet programs and also in more complex formats like statistical software, okay? So CSV is a well-recommended uh, uh, file type to publish your data. We also have spreadsheet files that are widely common, um, but the problem with spreadsheet is that some files might be proprietary. Excel, for instance, uh, if you're going to use Microsoft Excel, you're going to need a Microsoft license, so that might be a barrier for some people. Even though, in practice, you can open an Excel file in OpenOffice or in Google Spreadsheet. But the idea is, if you're going to choose between spreadsheets and CSV, it might be better to put the information in a CSV file in order to uh, avoid barriers of access, okay? My recommendation is that you can publish files, the same data set, in different formats so that you cover different uh, types of user, okay? Um, there are also text files that are similar to, t to CSV files. Um, and, but instead of being separated by, by a comma, they are, it's tabular data, so it's uh, segmented by a tab. But it's also an easy file that you can uh, import in a spreadsheet program. And we have other types of uh, formats, such as the JSON file that stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And I don't know if a few of you are programmers, so you might be familiar with this format. Uh, this is a useful format, as I said, for programmers or more technical users, uh, but it's uh, a, a format that's also open and accessible. My recommendation is um, which files should you choose. The idea is to know your final user. If you have expert users, then you might choose to upload your information on a JSON file, but if, you're, you, you, if your users are not that technical, maybe it's better to upload your information in a CSV file or you can upload it in the three different formats so that the user has a range of options to choose. Uh, and what you must avoid for sure is to publish information in PDFs. And I know that PDFs are widely common in government information. You publish a lot of reports on PDFs and this is a format that might be useful for some users because uh, your final interest might be just uh, to look out for information on a report. But a PDF is not a structure file. So, for instance, if you have a table on a PDF with numbers, you can do calculations or analysis out of that image. So you should avoid, if you have a data, uh, numbers, or information that's stored in a PDF, and we're going to see how to transform this later in the session, uh, you should prefer open formats instead of a PDF file, okay? And here is a graph that pretty much um, synthesize what I said. There are a lot of formats like RDF or HTML that are also open formats, um, as I said, more for technical users. Uh, but the idea is that here you have on the right side what are considered open formats and also uh, on the on the y-axis at the top you have structure information. So what you're looking for is structure and open information. Uh, there's three type files at the top, A, HP, KML, and GeoJSON are for geographic data that I'm not going to uh, talk about here in the session, but uh, if you're familiar with uh, geographic data, you might use this kind of formats. And this CSV and RD, uh, RDF are formats that are more used uh, for, for structured data in spreadsheets. You can see here that, for example, an XLS file, an Excel file, 
it's structured, but it's in a closed format. So the idea is that you choose from a range of options depending on your technical capacities and also on the final uh, characteristics of your final users, okay? And how does it look like? How does structure information look like? And you might, I've been talking a lot about well, these formats and how does it look like, but I'm gonna uh, see an example here. Mike, I don't know if you can uh, share my screen so that I can show a website, an open data website. Okay. Okay. Okay, there you go. You can see my screen. This is, for example, a website. It's um, it's a simple website of uh, of open data in the um, in the judiciary branch here in Costa Rica. And here, these are statistics about crimes throughout the country. But as you can say here at the beginning, I know that it's in Spanish, but the idea is that you have here at the beginning a description of your data set. You have uh, the title of this data set, the unique uh, URL where you can find it. You have what I, this is really important, the date of publication. As I said, timeliness is really important. So the user must know for sure when it was last published. And also here you have this is called the the frequency of of update this is this is said that this database is updated every month so these two aspects are really important to have in an open data portal that the user know, knows for sure how often is it updated and when was it last updated um you can say here that it has uh the form some formats and down here you have the data sets available in different formats so this is what I was saying that you, when you create a portal and you make data sets available, you can use different file types and formats. So here is information in an RD, RDF file, a CSV file, an XLM, XLS file. And it depends on uh, what are your final users. You can share from uh, a range of options. And also something that's really important here that I'm going to talk about later is that you have metadata or documentation about what the database has. And you uh, here is a list of variables. What do they mean? What's the type of, of uh, the format of, of this variable? So this is really important also to have in a database, OK? And once you download the information, structure information looks something like this, where you have um, this is a spreadsheet and you have columns. Each column is a variable and each row is an observa observation. And this is what structured data pretty much look like. This is what you are trying to look forward when you publish your data. Okay, so you have a variable and then uh, rows, you have each of the observations. Okay, so let me go back here to the session. Okay. Go back to the okay. Or yeah, to the presentation, please. Okay. Okay. So here, as I said, well, it's just an image of 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 how does a CSV file. Um, of a CSV file, and this is the same example as the database that I was showing you, where you have variables in each column and observations in each row. Okay, and the idea behind this um, this open data and this and why it's important to open data is that this is an example of of a project that I worked on a few years ago. Uh, we had, for example, I was working as I said in a national newspaper and we had municipal elections and what we wanted to do was to have a list of all the candidates running for the different posts around the country and to make an investigation to see if they had um, uh, if they were being investigated by by justice if they had debts with social security etc so when we go and ask for this information to the electoral institution they give us this one that the image you you can see at the left that it's a closed PDF. This is ju just an image of how it looked like. There were around like 300 pages of uh, information about the candidates, and it says, for example, here San Jose. This is the province 
uh, the, the region, the party, uh, the post, the ID number, and the number of the person. And you have this in a closed PDF in a vertical format. So we couldn't pretty much do much with that information because it was in a closed format. For example, we couldn't even make a simple calculation of how many, how many candidates were running in each region or, or around the country. And what we had to do, this was information that was available, it was for free, but it was in a closed format. So what we had to do as journalists was that we had to transform this PDF into an open format, a structured data uh, in a CSV file, and to, to obtain something like this at the end where you had this in variables, in rows, etc. And this was a process that took a few days. Um, to cover, but it's an example of if you're an institution and you collect this information, my question is why do you collect this in this format if you can structure it in this other format that it's more easy to access? And for instance, uh, we had presidential elections uh, this year in February, and now the Electoral Tribunal is publishing this information in a structured format. So it's a good example of uh, if you are civil society, if you're the final users, you can let the institutions know uh, which ways are best to publish the information in order uh, for you to use it. And the idea of having a structured data is this: is that at the end, what we do with it, what we did with this data was to create. This is an image of the web app that we created. But we created an application where each voter could search for their candidate and see if it has, see their, uh, their curricula, see if they had been previously investigated, etc. And they had information. We transformed this raw data in a closed format into information that was val valuable for the voters, in this case, and that produced knowledge. And that's what you will you try to do when you open data uh, to allow users to reuse it in order to create valuable information and knowledge out of the information that the public institutions publish, okay? So this is a good example of a good case where we have closed data and we open it in order to create knowledge, okay? Um, so well, here's, this is like um, the, um, the first part of the session. And once you know for sure, for example, what are the principles and what, in which formats should you publish your information, a question that might arise is, well, where do I get this data? I want to I wanna start an open data process in my institution, but I don't know which data to publish or where is it, how do I structure it? And this is the second part. And my first recommendation is to waste your data is that the first thing you should do is to make an inventory inside your institution. Public institutions collect a lot of information on a daily basis and have collect and produce a lot of information. So what you should do is that you should make an inventory in the different departments of the institution to make a list of what information do you have. So for instance, uh, the financial department might have information about public budget or public spending, but another department, for example, might have information about public contracts. Uh, and another one might have information about wages or about projects that the institution is investing in. So you should make an inventory and, and list who has this information, that's it, which departments, uh, which people is in charge of collecting this information, and in which formats. And you might find that, for instance, you might already have information that's being collected on structured formats, such as spreadsheets. So the, the, the process of opening this data might not be that difficult. Or, on the other hand, you might find that your information is on paper. And you should, if it's valuable information, you shouldn't discard this information. But um, you should try to think of strategies on how can you uh, transform this paper information to digital formats, OK? Another good thing to consider when, when you're trying to see which data to publish is to try to know your final users. Uh, for example, a good way of knowing uh, who are your final users is to talk to the press. Uh, if you have a, a press office within your institution, they might know which is the information that citizens or final users uh, ask more often. Uh, so this might give you a light of what information should you look for in your institution, okay? 
And another thing that might happen is that you might find a lot of information that you have in your institution, but it's stored as PDF files. And as I said, PDF is a format that is widely common on government institutions. For example, this is a table that the National Statistics, Statistics Institute published uh, with information regarding a household survey, and it's in PDF. These are numbers, but stored in a PDF file. Or you ha might have a file like this, that it's uh, the wages of all the public servants in a public university, um, but it's also in a PDF file. So as I said, if it's in a PDF, it's hard to make calculation and it's, it's a closed format. So what do you do if you have all these PDFs inside your institution? A good, a good thing is that there are tools to transform this into open data formats. I truly re recommend a tool called Tabula. It's a free tool available online that's super easy to use. If you're interested, I can, I can share you um, a tutorial that's pretty, it's pretty simple to use. You basically upload your PDF, you select the tables that you want to transform, and then this, this program transforms this into a CSV file to an open format. And for example, the, the example that I showed you before about opening data of municipal servants in the country, we use Tabula to uh, open this PDF into a CSV file, okay? So as I said, it's pretty much easy, it's pretty easy to use. But also, a good advice is that if you're a government institution and you created a PDF report with a table with numbers, this information came out of somewhere. And you might want to search for the primary source of information. So, uh, for example, if you have a table about the public wages that's in store in a PDF report, this information might be maybe in an open format in another department. So it might be already in an Excel file or in a CSV file, so you, ha you can skip this step of transforming your information on the CSV file because you might already have it. And as I said, a good thing is that when you start at this open data processes, if you make an inventory of what information are you producing and collecting, you might have a big panorama of, of that, that you might not be aware before that you actually have a lot of information that is structured and the only thing you need to do is well to to clean it a little bit and to uh, to open it and, and, and put it available online okay and another thing that might happen sorry uh, another thing that might happen is that you might have information that's on paper and that's also pretty common in institutions you might have for example for example something like this that's a ledger of local government that it's stored in beautiful tables in a notebook. And even though if this notebook can be available for consultation for the public, it's in paper so you can pretty much do anything with it instead of just um, transcribe it into digital formats. Um, and what do you do if you have information on paper? Should you just discard it uh, from the open data process? My advice is do not do this because you might have really valuable information that's on paper and that if you start a digitalizing process it might be information that it's really valuable for the final users. And a good example of this is also uh, a few years ago I worked on a project we were uh, trying to make an investigation about all the rentals of the executive branch of the government. So as a journalist I called the institutions to see if they could send me an Excel file of all the contracts and what I found is that they didn't have it online. They didn't have it in a digital format, and uh, they had it only on paper. Uh, so what I had to do, this is an image of one of the contracts. What I had to do is that I had to go to all these institutions uh, to, to see all these paper files, these documents, and start building a database out of these documents. Um, and my advice when you do this is the first thing you need to be clear at the beginning is which variables do you want to collect from these paper documents. And having this thing, you, have, you need to be clear um, with this at the beginning because it would, it would make your, your process easier. Uh, um, so for instance, in this case, I was interested in the number of the contract, the ID number of the procurement process, uh, the number of the enterprise, its ID number, etc., etc. 
And I built this database, as I said, with the contracts of uh, the public administration to get something like this at the end. Structure information of each institution, the procedure, uh, which uh, part of the department had bought it, the ID number, etc. And I had a lot of variables um, with which I was able to do uh, an analysis afterwards and create valuable insights out of this data. So the idea is that if you have paper documents, you definitely can transform that into structure formats. It might be costly, it might be difficult, it might take you time, but if it's information that's really valuable, you should definitely um, transform it into digital formats. How do you do this? As I said, the first thing is that you need to identify the variables and formats. You must find ways of digitalize the information. And a good advice is that, for example, if you have 400 contracts on paper, yeah, that might take you some time and you might not have resources uh, to have uh, a specific person dedicated to do this job for, for three weeks in your institution. So a good way is to ask for help. You can ask for help for civil society or journalists in order to help you make this information accessible. And even though it's not the subject of this of this talk, maybe you have already talked about this uh, throughout this course. The importance of when you're starting an open data process, it's really important to have a strong open data community, uh, w which w with uh, which you can interact, uh, have activities, uh, and get them involved in your open data process. Because open government, it it has not only to do with the government, it needs also civil society to be involved in the process. So a good, a good way of, of uh, creating a community is to get people involved in this initiative. So for example, you can have an event on a one-day event where you reunite, reunite uh, people, journalists, uh, people from NGOs that are willing to participate in opening uh, for example, public contracts and make it available in a digital format, okay? So this is a good tip if you want to engage with the community. What are the cons of this process is that, as I said, it's labor intensive, it's time consuming. I remember when I was doing this investigation, I spent like a month transcribing and digitalizing contracts. Uh, so it's really time consuming and it's also subject to human error. If you already have be, had been spending four hours digitalizing information, yes, you might make a mistake when you type something. Uh, so if you do this process, it's really important also to have someone to verify the errors and correct possible human errors that were uh, committed throughout the process. Okay? And also what might happen is that, well, you, have, you might have information in PDFs on paper, but you might encounter information that's also in other formats. And a good example of this is, for example, uh, this year I asked for the Costa Rican Congress for information about um, the congressmen, the congressmen that were attending each session of the Congress. And they have in the, in, in the Congress the dedicated department that collects this information. So every day they collect uh, the name of the congressman that attended the session, if he attended or not, the date, etc. And they collect this information on a daily basis. But the thing is that they store it in a Word document, a text file. Uh, so when they send me the information, well, it, it was in a do Word document, and I had to copy this information, put it on a spreadsheet in order to analyze. So my question was that uh, this is a department that's already collecting information so a good thing is to talk to these departments that are really collecting valuable information, but advise them to start collecting it in structured formats. So it won't, it, as a as a process, it wouldn't, it shouldn't be that diff different uh, from from storing information on a word file. For example, this department could definitely put this information on a spreadsheet and start structuring it in open structure format. So this is a good advice also that you should talk to the departments of the institution and see in which ways they are collecting the information and if it's possible to change these formats into open formats. So that it's easier, you're already collecting information in open formats, so it's easier to just upload it afterwards uh, in your open data portal, okay? Um, uh, 
and then another another important things that you need to take into account well you know the you know the formats uh, you know you you found out where's your data you know that the department has it in structure formats in a CSV file so is it ready to publish already well I would say no you need to go through the cleaning step of the open data process you need to clean your data and make it make sure that the information that you publish is tidy and neat and doesn't have any errors okay and basically cleaning data it's processing a data set to make it easier to consume so this might involve fixing inconsistencies in the data, errors, removing weird characters uh, or non-machine readable elements, uh, making sure that each variable uh, has the right format, etc. You need to make your data tidy and clean before publishing it. And what I mean by tidy data, and I really recommend this article here, uh, by uh, someone called Hadley Wickham. It's a bit technical, but it has really good examples of what tidy data is. So the two basic principles of tidy, tidy data is that each variable is saved in its own column, as we saw before in an example, and each observation is saved in its own row, okay? Uh, these are two principles that a tidy data must have. And, for example, this definitely doesn't look like a tidy, tidy data set because you have strange characters, you have colors, you have uh, different formats here, you have a number stored with text, so this is really a non-tidy data set, and it's really clear to see that it's not tidy. But you might also encounter something like this that it's a data set that might look structured, it looks structured, but if you look carefully, for example, this column that, that's called um, price euros, uh, it has a number, but it also has a weird character here. So, okay, maybe we should delete this character. So this is also how uh, non-tidy data might look like. Or it might look like, like this, that this is the example of that I showed you before about uh, the candidates running for the local governments that was in a PDF file. So when I transformed it into a CSV file, it looked like this. So even though if it that it was in an open format already, it wasn't structured. So I needed to clean I needed to clean uh, the data set because I had all the variables, all the information in a single column. And what I needed to do is to create different columns with the information okay so I ha this had to go through a long cleaning process um, so the idea is that at the end with clean data you have variables in a correct format you don't have merged cells that that means when you have two columns uh, in one you should avoid that uh, a single value per cell, no strange characters, and this happens a lot, for example, uh, if you had, well, in Spanish, if you had accents uh, or, or different characters that might not be well read in, in some programs, and you need to be sure that your data doesn't have errors, okay? What are the most common errors that you might find in your data? You might have data stored in the wrong format, and like for example, well, this is actually I made a mistake here. Is for example, if you have numbers stored as text, uh, for because if you have a number that is stored as a text, uh, as a text, if you try to do, for example, a simple calculation like a sum, you won't be able to do it because it, it's going to give you an error because it it isn't stored as a number; it's stored as a text. Or for example, you might have uh, you need to be really careful when you use dates because, for example, if you see this. Uh, it depends if you, if your if your file is in English or in Spanish. This might be the same date, or this might be different dates. Is it September? Uh, if it if it's September the twelfth, or is it uh, the nine of December? We don't know, and it depends on the format that you're using for the date. As as I um, before in the example that I show you about the the open data portal of the judiciary branch, uh, they had. Uh, they, they it, it's it said which format they use for the date so it's really important that that you know this for sure and also each column should have only one data type um, and I'm gonna see an image here for example for example you shouldn't have a number and a text in a in the same in the same column you should avoid that 
And also, you should avoid multiple values in columns. And you should avoid things like this, where you have, for example, uh, absolute numbers mixed with percentages. This should be two different variables, and not having this in a single variable, because, again, if you try to make a calculation with this, you won't be able to do this, because this is stored as a text, OK? And also, you might encounter problems like this, where you have different variables in a single cell. So you must split the cell into different variables and clean these variables before publishing it. Uh, this is an example of having multiple values in a cell. If you see the image on the left uh, in the column that's actually called column, you see here, for example, that we have M and some numbers and F and some numbers. And this is actually two different variables stored in one single column. And what we should do, when, what you should do when you're cleaning this data set is, is to split that column into two different columns, as you can see on the right. Uh, in this case, it was a column called sex, where M stands for male and F for female, and then an age variable, where you have different age ranges in this case. So you should definitely avoid having this, uh, like the example on the left, and instead trying to split this into two different variables. Remember, each variable uh, must have a unique value and not different formats or different variables in one column. And another common mistake is typing errors. And this happened because when we collect information, uh, it's always subject to human error. Uh, so for example, in this, in this table right here, uh, it's the name of a person. And for example, in the second in the second row, we have a blank space at the beginning, and at the last row, we had two blank spaces in the middle. So even though it's the same name, it's written in different ways. So uh, the program will read it as three different values when actually it's the same value. So you should uh, be careful with this with these typing errors. And then another thing that happens a lot is, for example, when you use acronyms versus full names. So for example, uh, the University of Costa Rica, its acronym is UCR, and people normally say UCR to refer to it, the university. And if you find in a data set that you have uh, the two names, you have University of Costa Rica and UCR, you should uh, unify them into a single value. Uh, for example, if you're going to refer to the University of Costa Rica, all the values must be UCR or the complete name. But you can have both because, as I said, it's going to be read uh, as two different values what it, where, when it actually corresponds to a single one. Okay, So you should uh, avoid this. And another common mistake um, of non-tidy data is when you have something like this. Um, this is actually a table. You should avoid tables. You should have databases, not tables. And at the top, this, these columns are actually, um, this should be a variable called income instead of just having this in a long format as variables. Because how you call, th these are values of a variable and not variables itself. So if you want to make this data tidy, tidy it should look like this, where you have a variable called income. And here you have, for example, let me go back to this. Here, for example, you have religion agnostic with an income of less than 10K. It's The frequency is 27. And in this range, the frequency is 34. So if you have it on a tidy form, and here you have agnostic, 10K, 27, agnostic, in this other range, 34. So instead of having it in a long format, you have this in a single variable, and then you have the frequency. That's what you should look forward in a clean database. Avoid this, and instead have something that looks like this. And if you want to know more in detail on how to clean data or what type of errors are common 
in your databases in order to avoid them when you're opening your information. I recommend these two links. This is a guide. It's called the Guide to Bad Data that lists uh, some of the most common errors that you might find in databases and, and that you need to avoid. And also this article, as I said, that uh, has a lot of examples on how uh, on tidy data and also if you are uh, familiar with a statistical software called R, uh, it gives you an example of how to clean this data and make it tidy. Okay. Um, and also something that's really, really important that you consider in your cleaning process it's to create documentation of your data set. And this is called metadata, uh, that it's basically information about a data set uh, that must include, for example, a title, a description, uh, how is this information collector, who is the author, uh, the license, uh, and also to make a list of the variables and what do they mean. This is really important because uh, the users, as I said, need to know for sure what does the database contain and what are the variables, which are the formats, because if you're not sure uh, about this, you might make um, wrong analysis uh, with this information. So for example, if you have, if you download a database from the Ministry of Education about, uh, and you have this variable called level of education, and you have one, five, three, one, four, you might think, oh, well, does this mean that the person is in first grade? Or does it have one year of schooling? Or does it mean that it's, it's in his first year of the university? You don't know. If you don't have the right documentation, you don't know what this means, so this variable becomes useless. But if you have metadata, it will look something like this, where you have uh, the name of the variable, what does it mean? So this is actually not a number of variable, but it's a, a categorical variable with different um, with different codes. So one stands for elementary education, two for primary education, five for a bachelor degree or higher. So if you have the metadata, then you know for sure what does this variable means. So it's easier, and you avoid mistakes when you're analyzing this data set. And as I said, this is really important that you create documentation with your database. And this is the example that I showed you before about the, the database of the judiciary branch here in Costa Rica, where you have all the list of variables, the description, the type of data, etc. You must create this when you upload a data set online. And this is another example of how metadata might look like. This is, for example, uh, metadata on the household survey. So here's the name of the variable, which was the question that was asked in the survey in order to get this, this, this data, and the values. Here, the value of 1 means that it's a man, the value of 2 that it's a woman. So you know for sure, if you see the metadata, what does the variable mean. So don't forget to create documentation in the cleaning stage of the data process. If you upload a data set online without documentation, then it's pretty much useless because the users don't know for sure what they are encountering. Uh, so you need to create documentation, OK? And and finally, um, I want to talk about something called interoperability. Uh, that's also a concept that's that, that's used when we talk about open data. And this basically means that uh, this denotes the ability of diverse systems and organizations to work together. And in this case, when we're talking about open data, is the ability to interoperate or intermix different data sets. Uh, so the idea is that if you're, if you're the government and you're starting open data processes within your institutions, if you have structured information uh, that complies with certain principles and standards, then uh, it might be easier for government data databases to communicate. So imagine, for example, that you're um, uh, you're the you're, you're a public servant that um, is in charge of giving subsidies to families in poverty, but uh, actually the subsidies are scattered in different institutions. So, for example, the Ministry of Education gives gives subsidies to education and another institution gives subsidies to single mothers or uh, to to build 
uh, to, to, to give housing to families in poverty. And if you have this information unstructured and in different departments, uh, if you're this public servant that's in charge of uh, seeing if a specific household or family uh, is subject to this, this politics, you might have to go and search in these different departments and institutions. If the information is interoperable and the database uh, can connect with each other, it should be as easier as, as that the, this, this person should type the, the ID number of this family and the system will connect to different databases to see if this family is actually in poverty or if it already has a housing a subsidy or a subsidy for education, etc. This makes uh, processes more easy within the government and also for the final users. And a common thing when we talk about interoperability is that we talk about APIs. Uh, and APIs is basically stands for Application Programming Interface. And for data, this is usually a way provided by the data publisher, that means your institution, for programs or app to read data directly over the web. And this might sound complicated at the beginning. I, as I said, I'm a journalist, so I, I didn't understand quite well how API works be worked before. So it looks something like this. And a good example that helped me understand uh, how an API works is that imagine, for example, if you go to a restaurant and you sit in a restaurant and you're given a menu where you can choose from a wide range of options. And uh, the kitchen is the, serv the service provider that actually prepares your food and puts, puts it in your table. But you need something uh, to connect you to the kitchen because you can't go straight into the kitchen and ask the chef to prepare your plate. So that's when the waiter comes into the equation. The waiter go comes and takes your order, then it takes your order back to the kitchen, the kitchen prepares your order, and then the waiter takes your order to the table. That's what basically an API does. It's like the waiter. So you have uh, a web browser or an, an application in the web, and this connects to the API and uh, asks for an information request. Then the API is connects to the database. They could be, it could be uh, one database or multiple databases within the institution. It retrieves a response to the API, and then the API gives a response to the web app in the browser. And for example, you might have APIs, for example, for information that's updated quickly when you have best amounts of information. So it, it should be more easy to just create an API instead of uploading data sets every day online. So basically, when you uh, make an API available, you are allowing users to connect directly to your database systems to ask for information and to extract this information uh, automatically. So for example, if you are, um, I don't know, an entrepreneur that wants to create uh, an app about traffic accidents, and this information is being uh, up uploaded um, on, on real time in a government database about where are the accidents located around the country, then this programmer, this entrepreneur can connect to the API uh, so that he can create a final product where you just log in into the app and see where the accidents are happening. And this makes um, processes more easy, especially to advanced users like programmers or even even journal some journalists uh, use APIs. So should my, the question might be, should I always, when I open data sets, create an API? No. It's not a requirement. It depends on your information. As I said, it might be useful if you have information that's uploaded really quickly, for example, car accidents or, I don't know, uh, climate data about rainfall and other climate indicators. Um, and if you have the technical capacities. My advice is that, for example, when you're making the inventory of your data, when you already identify which data sets are valuable for publication, that you have a meeting with your TI department to see if some of these data sets are subject to, um, to be open through an API instead of just uploading the CSV files or the open data format files, OK? And the idea of this, of why interoperability is important is, as I said, it really saves times for users and public servants. 
they can easily access and analyze data sets instead of uh, going online and now downloading the databases they can connect directly. And the fact also that the information is well structured and documented allows people to work with big data sets and vast amounts of information. And also it increases the consumption of information within institutions. If you're able to connect with different uh, institutions of the government online with APIs or with um, or, 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 or throughout the internet, then the processes within the government might become more efficient instead of just doing all the all the steps uh, in person or going in person to the institution. So this might make information more accessible not only to the users but also to people inside the government. And the final remarks here um, is that please don't be afraid to start an open data process. It might sound a lot at the beginning to comply with you know, the principles and getting the information and structuring it and cleaning, but the thing is that it's not that difficult. There are a lot of people that have already gone through this process and that can help you, that can orient, orient, orient you in what you, you, what are the steps that you need to take. And you might already know this, but open data has a large potential economic value, uh, increases transparency, create business opportunities, benefits consumer, and at the end, the idea of opening data, it's also uh, to make, um, to allow users to create knowledge and valuable insights out of the information that the government is providing. So it's really important and it's, it's really um, a good thing that the government can do to start these processes to connect better with the, with the final users, with the citizens, and uh, to make information available, free, without a cost to everyone. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. As I said, I hope you have questions and I can answer uh, these questions. You're going to have the final presentation, so if you want to check on some of the links that I shared throughout the presentation, they're, they're there in the presentation, so don't hesitate also to ask questions, and um, I'm here to help if you, if you have any, any concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camila, for this great presentation. Uh, we dive certainly into more technical aspects. Uh, that we have already seen in the last presentation. So thank you. I think we got to this point um, um, we, we built um, up to this point and, and so your presentation fits very well uh, to this uh, progressive way of introducing um, the lease and this group of officers to, to open data. So thank you. Thank you very much for all the insights. Um, it, it's great to see it in a, in a simple way presented, although it's uh, perhaps a uh, complicated once you start doing it. It takes a lot of time, as you mentioned. Um, it's, uh, and so quality of information is key. Uh, and to have quality of information, of course, you need to make sure that you set the infrastructure in a way that uh, will ease that process at the end. So um, great. Thank you for all the insights. Um, so we do have questions. Uh, participants were actually putting questions from the very beginning. Like to have uh, Henry and uh, the project um, to step in and help us moderate in this, uh, this part of the session. Thank you, Henry. Meanwhile, Henry connects. Uh, Camila, please do stay um, connected on your cam uh, so that we can see you while you respond. Okay. Henry, are you there? Um, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Ah, yes, of course. You might be, I might have to give you permission. I'm sure that's what's happened. Uh, so you have permissions now. I apologize for giving you the permission. Um, hopefully you can turn. There we go. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm getting feedback. Okay, there we go. Okay, yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Camila, for that excellent presentation. Um, uh, we're connecting with you, as Mike noted, via Belize. Uh, and uh, so far, this is our fourth session. It's been an incredible 
glaring opportunity I know for myself, and I guess I can speak for the other participants. Um, I want to echo Mike's uh, initial vote of thanks to our partners here at CETO. Uh, I know they're uh, taking their time out. All, all the participants are taking their time out today. It's been wonderful having them uh, available for these training sessions. I know it's really valuable uh, for everyone at this point. Uh, can you hear me, Gabrielle? Is that better? Are you guys hearing me clearly? Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Yes. I guess I was probably just a little further away from my microphone. Yes, but um, uh, again, I was just thanking all the participants for taking their time out. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful uh, training session thus far, um, and we want to thank everybody for for doing that. So, as Mike noted, um, we're entering the Q and A session, Camila, and uh, I wanted to start off with a question that. Francisco, the acting director of CETO, the central IT office here in Belize, for the government of Belize, asked. He yeah, asked two questions. Uh, the first is asked, yeah, uh, asked. in terms of safety and privacy concerns, of could you address perhaps some of the, uh, the general legal and privacy concerns uh, when these data sets are created? Okay, regarding legal and privacy concerns, as I said, my first recommendation should be to check the national legislation on what is considered public and private information. Uh, for example, you, I don't know if in Belize you have a Freedom of Information Act. Here in Costa Rica, for example, we don't have it, so uh, all the, um, the legal aspects of accessing data uh, are in the jurisdiction of, of the constitutional um, branch. But uh, there are clear gu guidelines of what information is public or not. So my first recommendation is check your national legislation to see which information is public or not. Most commonly, what information, uh, um, the information that's normally subject to privacy uh, concerns, it has to do with the national security. Uh, and this is a thin line because sometimes governments might uh, said that this information is not open because of national security interests and actually uh, well it doesn't comply with that aspect so um, that that might happen uh, but also information that's normally private is for example sensible information about individuals for example health uh, for example my medical records shouldn't be public this is private information and also uh, tax records normally tax records aren't uh, public for example you can know how much information, how much money did the government collected on taxes, but you normally it's private to know that this company paid this amount of money in taxes. Normally, tax information is private. Uh, what other information? Yeah, I, I, I might say this like sensible um, uh, private information, medical, uh, for example, information about sexual orientation or information that might be subject uh, to, to, to privacy, privacy regulations. Uh, another recommendation would be um, if you, for example, are an institution and you're collecting um, information with final users, if you make, for example, a survey, uh, when, when you give the survey to the users, they should know for sure what are you going to do with the data. So, for instance, normally in a, for example, a household survey, uh, when you publish a database, you can identify uh, individuals. You have, for example, uh, information about a household. It's it's called anonymization of the data, uh, so that you can't identify the specific users that provided that information, but that the information is disaggregated in an anonymized format, in an anonymous um, way. 
so that you can make calculations and create insights out of that data without identifying uh, the people. So if you're going to be the one that collects the information, you uh, have to, the, the user has to know for sure uh, what are the purposes, why are you collecting this information and must agree with uh, the privacy policies that you ask for in the information. But as I said, you shouldn't publish sensible information uh, regarding individuals and be able to identify them. Something that sometimes it's a concern with uh, people working in public institutions is, should my wages be public? And in a lot of legislations, you should be able, uh, because it's it, these are wages that are being paid with public taxes, and so the, um, the wages of the public servants are considered in a lot of uh, countries' public information. And you can identify the name of the person and its wage. Um, and in that way, you can monitor, for example, how is money being spent uh, within the government. So, as I said, please check your national legislation uh, so that you are clear on what can or cannot publish. I was asking uh, regarding uh, the most common open structure format. Uh, which is the most common open structure format, or is it irrelevant? And can be adapted regardless for open data use. Camila, I believe your mic is is muted. Yes. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. As I said before, there are a lot of uh, open data formats. Uh, so, okay. Uh, we, there are a lot of open data formats, as I said before, and it depends on the final users. The most common formats, as I said, is the CSV file, the RDF file, uh, adjacent files. Uh, so, uh, what I recommend is that you can upload your data sets in different formats. For example, a CSV file can be easily transformed into an Excel file or a JSON file. So it, it shouldn't be that difficult to just, if you have um, your data set in one format, then you can transform it uh, to different formats. So the, as I said, the most widely used are CSV files or RDF uh, XML files. You can check the graph that's in the presentation to see which are the most common. But I recommend that you, at first, use CSV files because it's like the most widely used, I would say. And it also depends on your data. For example, as I said, if you're working with geospatial data, uh, it might be better if you use GeoJSON or, or shape files instead of, um, Great, of CSV because it's not going to work that way. Young, also from uh, like Geo. Uh, ask the question regarding sharing of information uh, and difficulties accessing that. Have you had any experience dealing with institutions or departments that do not want to readily share information? If so, uh, how were you able to eventually secure the data? If not, what would you recommend as the best approach to receive the data, to secure the data? Yes, uh, this is a problem that, we, that I've encountered as a journalist a lot, a lot of times, that when you ask for information, the institutions do not want to share it with you. And for instance, um, something that happened, and, and it's a process of talking with the institutions and making them see that the information, they are not the final owners of the information that they are collecting that we, the citizens and the users, are the ones who own that information, so it should be available for everyone. Um, I remember, like, maybe four years ago, we had a lot of these problems with the National Statistical Institute, that, for example, if you want to access a household survey to do research or analysis, you have to fill a lot of documents. Uh, they wouldn't give you the information if you weren't a researcher in the university, and the, it was quite difficult to get a data set. Um, and I remember that one time we had, as I said, we don't have a, a, a law uh, to access, a, a law of freedom of access to information here. So we had to put, um, I don't know how it's the translation exactly, so forgive me if I don't translate it right, but um, 
we had to go to the constitutional court uh, to make a demand to access that information. And we luckily won uh, the process. And, and this has been done since we don't have an access to information law. Um, a lot of, uh, of legislation and jurisprudence uh, concerning access to information has been done by citizens who are denied information and had to go to the courts uh, to ask institutions to publish the information. And this has been a long process. Right now, I'm glad to say that a lot of institutions had under have understood the importance of having information available in open formats, uh, in, in structure formats. Uh, so uh, what I would recommend is that first try, if, if you're denied information, try to talk to the institutions and make them understand that the, actually uh, it's your right to get this information and they have the obligation to give it to you. So if, if they are not quite used to, to providing information to the public, this, this might be a process. But you have to be really proactive and really insistent on the information that you want to get. So please try to talk and convince the, the institutions about this. They are not the owners of the information. They are just, um, they just manage this information and they have to make it accessible to the public because it's the right of the final users. Gabriel Ball, also from Cito. Uh, he noted that uh, you showed us the end products of the data cleaning operations. However, I know a lot is done behind the scenes to get the final product. What technologies do you use, recommend, or recommend for automating the data cleaning operation? Perhaps uh, some EL tools recommendations? Um, well, it depends a lot on your technical capacities and uh, what you're trying to achieve at the end and what, are, what is the structure of the data. So a lot of the cleaning process can be done, for example, in a spreadsheets. And the problem with this is that it's not automated. So if you have to clean a lot of databases at once, then you have to go through the process all over again. So if it's uh, just one data set and it's not that complicated to, to, to clean it, then you can do it with spreadsheets. But there are also other types of software that I can share with you the link here at the end. There's one called Open Refine that it's a really, um, it's a really good program for, for cleaning operations. Um, so it, 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 you can work with large data sets there. You can store all the changes that you did so you can automate the process. And also you can do clean operations with uh, statistical programs like R. Uh, where also you can automate the code and run the clean operations with multiple data sets. You can do it with uh, programming languages like Python. So it really depends on your technical capacities and uh, the databases that you're working with. As I said, if it's something quite simple as, as deleting blank spaces, you can do it on a spreadsheet. But if it's more complicated, it might be better to use OpenRefine or R or Python in order to clean this data. Uh, as I said, I can share you some links about these tools and tutorials, and, and it just depends uh, on, the, on the information that you're using. Uh, he's asking uh, in terms of large high-definition files or, or uh, images. Archiving of large high-definition images, video footage, movies, uh, sound files, etc. Uh, is there a cost-effective way of archiving these files safely uh, in your experience. Well, uh, to be completely honest, I'm not quite familiar with how do you store these files on structured files. As I said, I'm, most fo I, I'm more focused, focused on uh, structured information as spreadsheets or databases. Um, if you saw the graph that I showed earlier about the formats, for example, JPG files um, are considered open, but it's not structured information. So uh, to be completely honest, I don't know which is the best way to store these files safely. Maybe it would be best to contact like a TI, like your TA department in your institution 
uh, so that to see and find ways on on how to to store this information. Uh, would I recommend, for example, if if there are some of this information stored in images or or sounds or or movies, is there a way to structure this information, or that the, is it really necessary to upload this information online, or or can we have it it, it, it stored uh, differently? So I would recommend that you talk to your TI department and also to the to the people in your institution that. Perfect. Thank you, Camila. Uh, I have a question from my end, uh, and it's uh, when you were making the presentation, uh, getting the data, uh, and you uh, made a point of uh, making an inventory of the data. Uh, I know a lot of public institutions, and I'm sure the participants will agree, that they have a wealth of data ready, but they don't know how to access it or, or, or how to structure it. Um, so creating that inventory could be a very, very crucial first step without uh, any huge overhead or expense. Uh, could you, again, give us a little bit more detail regarding that section? Because I know it could be of use to our, our participants here in Belize. Yes, as I said, uh, uh, institutions produce information on a daily basis, and they might not be aware of the amount of information that they produce. So an inventory uh, would be basically a list. You, you, you just have to go through every department and, and try to, you can do this, uh, for example, doing interviews and having meetings or, or discussion groups, and try to list all the information that you collect. So for example, uh, this department collects information about budget, about spending and the, for example, the budget information, it's stored in, in this specific database and this other information is actually stored on paper and this, uh, the other department collects information about contracts that are stored on paper, etc. And once you make that list, uh, my advice is that if you're going to start an open data process, okay, you have a list of, I don't know, uh, 10 potential, uh, 20 or 30 potential uh, types of information and data sets that the institution has and collects. And you have to prioritize. Uh, and this pri prioritize which data sets are going to be subject first to uh, structuring them and uh, make them readily available in an open format. And this prioritization should be done considering two things. First, as I said, that the, the final demand, who uh, is going to use this information uh, to consider always the final users, and also uh, the resources of the institution. For example, if you already have, for example, budget information, it's something that it's quite useful uh, for the for the final users. So this information might already be in a structured format. So the cleaning process and documentation might be easier than uh, digitalizing uh, paper contracts. So you should maybe prioritize the budget first, and then um, afterwards start digitalizing the information on paper. So it has to depend first. Be sure what information do you have. Think of the final users uh, to see which information might be um, more valuable to them in order to prioritize it. And then start the prioritization. And what if the amount of data is not uh, a substantial amount? Um, but it's, it's important data. Uh, what do you uh, recommend? Uh, seeing maybe we might not have uh, pages and pages of uh, contract data, for example, where a new ministry or sometimes ministries or departments merge, uh, and you'd have uh, a new uh, new team members coming on board or uh, new responsibilities uh, being taken under your uh, But it's important data. Uh, how do we go about not being discouraged to overlook that data if it's not if we don't have a wealth of data uh, on hand? I believe that the quantity of the data, uh, the quality should be before quantity of the data. So we don't expect that um, that open data sets uh, have to be huge data sets with thousands of hundreds of information. It can be a data set that has 
50 observations. You might have only 20 contracts, but are the contracts that you have in your institution, and it's valuable information. So you shouldn't be stopped or have doubts to publish this information that is actually valuable just because you don't have that much information. As I said, also it, it might happen that, uh, for example, with I don't know, you're gonna you you want to start opening information about contracts in the government, and of, you, you might have ten years of information back with a lot of contracts of uh, the government. So uh, something that you can do is okay. Well, I'm gonna start digitalizing the contracts um, beginning in 2018. And this is going to be a process, and probably in two or three years, you're going to have a huge data set, and your your data will look more vast. But uh, the quantity at the beginning shouldn't stop you. Uh, what I said, the first thing to consider is if this information. At Camila, uh, seeing that IT managers uh, might not be at that sort of executive level or decision making level within their their ministry or department, uh, how would you advise them to to approach? Uh, maybe that executive manager, that director, to to start uh, or embrace uh, an open uh, data policy within their their organization. Uh, a lot of the IT managers, I would believe, from my experience, um, uh, tend not to be as proactive or would not want to to step on toes, if you will. They need that that okay from the uh, executive level uh, desks, so to speak. So. How would you encourage them, or what recommendations would you have uh, for these IT managers that deal with this, these data uh, and the, the persons creating the data uh, to, to embrace or, or speak to that upper level management structure to embrace an open data policy within their organization? Well, I think a key a key part of, of creating an open data policy inside an institution is to have public servants that are committed to the cause. And um, a good a good way to start um, is to have it can be one or two persons that are that understand the importance of open data. And what I encourage them to do is um, to just knock the door and try to convince more people inside the institution to understand. Uh, open data policies, open data principles, and to see how they can incorporate this on their daily work. Sometimes when we talk about starting open data processes inside institutions, people imagine that it's a lot of effort that you have to change the way you do your, your daily work, but sometimes it might not be that difficult and it might uh, just be as easy as changing uh, some specific practices that you do on a daily basis. Uh, in order to start creating more open and accessible information. So what I recommend is that try to search for a couple of, of, of persons inside your institution that understand about open data, that are committed to improving and implementing open data policies, and uh, try to make a, a, a structure present. It, you, for example, can, can do a structure presentation or uh, a small meeting or event where you present uh, this topic to other other colleagues inside your institution so that they understand the importance and always keeping in mind why are you doing this why it is important to open data um, this has to be something that you really need to take into account to make people uh, understand that you're not just opening data because it's 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 cool to do open data right now no it's because it's something that might help uh, you connect with the final users that might make your institution more transparent, that might encourage uh, creating new products. Thank you, Camila. I see we have two questions here. Uh, one from Byron. Uh, he is with the Ministry of Public Service here in Belize. Uh, and I just asked if he could expand a bit on his question, but uh, let's give it a go. Uh, he says, I believe we need to access what information should be made public or is in demand. Then we can have an idea of the volume or effort necessary. What's your uh, recommendation? Assess, not access. We need to assess what information should be made public or in, is in demand. Then we can have an idea of the volume and effort necessary. And I believe that's, that's what you uh, spoke about in terms of that inventory 
uh, 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 Yes, uh, I think it relates a little bit about what I was talking before about knowing your final users and the demand in order to prioritize the data sets. And a good advice of knowing your demand, as I said, is uh, you might go to the press uh, office of your ministry and uh, ask, okay, what is the information that the users normally ask here? Uh, and this might be a good indicator of, of, of knowing which information should you open. Uh, you can also make events, for example, if you have um, a public event where you invite journalists or citizens uh, from NGOs and you just ask them, okay, um, I'm starting this open data process and I want to know what information can be valuable for you uh, so that I'm, I know for sure which information to open and they might, know, they might tell you. Uh, and this is important because what we see a lot is that institutions publish information that it's not really valuable for the final user so you might invest a lot in your portal and upload your data sets but at the end nobody's using them so you really need to think who are the final users and I have uh, a question from Inaldi Gomez from the uh, immigration department here in Belize the Belize government law states that government salaries and similar information should be public knowledge Yet we have not seen this kind of information readily available and much less provided in a timely manner. Uh, can you relate with something like this in other countries? What ministry is responsible to release this? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, institutions are not proactive on publishing this information and that's what we need to address. Uh, for example, in the case of Costa Rica, each institution is, there's not like a centralized institution that publishes this information. So most of the ministries, each ministry has its, uh, some ministries have an open data portal, some doesn't. Uh, so it depends on every institution. Right now, for example, uh, there was an executive order about um, opening data in the country that states that every institution must publish this kind of information. So it's a process. Some, some institutions, have, as I said, have already published this and some not, but so, something that might help is precisely this, uh, so that the government in an executive order or in an open data policy uh, states that every institution should publish this information. As I said, it's a process to make institutions proactive in publishing the information. It's not something that happens uh, in one day or in one month. It's a long process. So, and it's important also to have a strong civil society always asking and pushing for uh, this information to be open. It, it, it can be just from one side of the government. You need to have citizens involved in the open data community to push uh, considering that interministerial databases may have overlapping variables within, inherently there would be various approaches to the consolidation of these data sets. Approaches such as identifying and making one ministry the primary data source or using cross validation methods and extracting a final cleansed data set uh, that can be utilized. Any comments on what approach can be used in such scenarios? Uh, okay, uh, regarding connecting different data sets, the basic principle is that you have to have unique identifiers in common so that you can merge different data sets. So the idea is when you start this open data policies, uh, you should have some standards on uh, how to structure this information so that the databases can connect. And our, for example, the example that I put uh, before about uh, the social programs of the government, uh, if they are going to implement uh, an open policy, an interoperable policy within their databases, they should all have a meeting and agree on what are the standards and the variables that they are going to um, uh, that they're going to use and that, that they're going to structure with, with these databases so that they can connect with, with each other. Um, so, yes, if, if uh, I don't know if I answered 
your question extracting a final clean bit. Okay, yes, no, uh, my first approach is that you must have, as I said, databases that can be uh, combined. And to do this, you have to have unique identifiers. So, for example, um, uh, you have a unique ID of the region so that if you use the ID number for region in different government data sets, almost have the same ID number so that you don't have errors when merging these data sets. Uh, and it speaks to the interoperability portion of your presentation. Okay, I, I have a, a, a curious question uh, on my end, Camila. Uh, you, throughout the presentation, you noted that some forms of information comes in, in the closed format PDF uh, in tables, or they come via letters uh, uh, that are not uh, already in an open data uh, format. Um, I'm curious to understand or, or know, because those PDFs, they still play a role. For example, uh, during presentations from our Statistical Institute here in Belize, uh, they provide overviews of trends, for example, in the economy, uh, unemployment, uh, inflation, etc. Uh, and the tables are easily readable for uh, different end users, while open data would be for a different group, a different demographic. So uh, when you, you're talking about uh, making or, or identifying the, the primary source of that information, because as you mentioned, that primary source would exist, but not necessarily in an open data format. Um, I'm curious as to the workflow, because uh, the the Statistical Institute, for example, what I've seen thus far in their reports are, are all those these charts, these uh, diagrams, uh, these tables that are neat, are very attractive to, to view and look at. Um, so, again, the, the I guess my, my main point is how do we change uh, or introduce that workflow where they have all that information to then move into uh, creating these open data uh, formats and data sets within these institutions that are predominantly information based. Okay, yeah, I think the best the best advice that I can give you is that okay, can it's okay to publish your report with charts and pre pre analyzed tables uh, in a PDF format because as you said this information might be useful for some end users. But try to think also of other users that are interested, for example, in the uh, every year the National Institute has uh, publishes their household survey and they, yes, they make a PDF report, they make a press event where they give all the journalists the PDF report. But what happens if you're a journalist that is interested in making other calculations or crossing other variables that are not available in the PDF? in the analysis that the institute made. Um, and you have to think of those users also. Uh, as an institution, this uh, doesn't imply extra work for you because the only thing that you have to do is to publish your PDF report and also publish the database accessible for download. And that's what I mean um, when thinking about different types of users. It's OK to use your PDF, but if, you, if this PDF, PDF is based on databases and structure information make this information accessible also because sometimes what happens uh, for example I remember a report um, done by the Planning Institute here that did an, an index of uh, social progress in all the different districts in the country and the report was complete and they had all the tables of the index on a PDF file uh, so they didn't make the Excel file available, so I had to transform this using uh, programs like Tabula or other programs. I had to transform it into an Excel file in order to make my own map and my graphs and my analysis. And this is an extra step that you're forcing the users um, to do. And there also might be users that do not know that they can actually extract information from that PDF. So, Excellent. Thank you, Camila. We have a Another question from Byron. Uh, do you recommend just providing the raw data, or should the portal provide analytical tools that end users can use? Uh, 
Uh, I think it depends first on the of the on the technical infrastructure that you have. Uh, there are a lot of portals. For example, if you think at the World Bank Open Data Portal, that yes, you can dou download the data sets, but you can also see play with in the website and see some charts and uh, tables, etc. Um, I believe it depends. This, uh, for example, interactive uh, chart tools uh, online. They're pretty useful for some users, but what we, you should not do is to publish only uh, the platform where you can do the graphs and the tables, but you cannot download the primary data set. And this is a common mistake that a lot of institutions do. I remember, for example, this year, I, I don't remember if it was at the beginning of the year or at the end of last year, that the government here published uh, a website that it was a map of all the infrastructure works around the country. So you can search, um, th there was a, a search engine and you can search in your community which projects were being made, et cetera, et cetera. But you, it was just an interactive map and you couldn't download the database that was, that was uh, used to create that map. And for example, I couldn't do a calculation on, okay, how many projects are active right now in the country? or how many infrastructure projects are being built in my community. I couldn't do that because I didn't have access to the raw data, I just had the interactive tool. So this is what you shouldn't do. Um, when, I, when I talked to the government uh, officials in charge, they said, well, this, oh, the database is going to be open in a few months, so it's the second stage of the, of the project. I wouldn't recommend that. First, make the data set available, the raw data, and then you can add other functionalities like... Mula, uh, I see Byron uh, seems he might be typing another question or making a comment. Um, but I see that, yes, a comment, thanking you. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions, guys? Uh, I know that we're running up close to time. Um, Mike? Uh, any any questions or, or any comments on your end? I see that we have Juan Pablo also typing. Thank you, Henrik. Um, no, but uh, we're ten, uh, eight minutes away from uh, closing time. I wanted to suggest you to start wrapping up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, insightful information that Camila has uh, provided uh, in, this, in this session. Thank you. Um, the presentation, the video, uh, and the chat with the links and everything will be provided to all participants. Um, so um, I should say that there's a lot of good questioning on this um, uh, presentation. Um, I want to point out that as I've seen in the case of Costa Rica, which is very close to Camila, um, I, I've seen uh, how they progressed on changing their mentality um, institutional culture, if you may, government culture from switching to uh, uh, kind of close um, culture to, to obviously the, the open culture. It's not easy. Um, one thing that um, helped in the process, and I would like to say and, and point out to it, was our intervention uh, with the Organization of American States on what is called the Open Data National Roundtable that we implemented, and with that we worked on supporting uh, Costa Rica in the development of their open um, data policy, uh, Camila mentioned. I can, I can see this conversation going uh, on the first part of that national dialogue table that we had in Costa Rica, uh, where the questions, was, the questions were about um, Precisely, uh, why do we need to open this data um, with name, uh, amounts, um, so on and so forth that will compromise us? It compromise our security. Uh, people is going to rob us. Uh, people is going to uh, kidnap us. When, you can imagine all kind of uh, discussions that went on uh, on on it. But um, hopefully that was a, a starting point. Uh, I would like to think that this. A session is a starting point also in, 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 in that change. Um, if we measure now uh, the impact of uh, opening the data uh, in Costa Rica on those specific subjects, that probably without having uh, 
in-depth study of that, obviously, as you would me, I can say that it was minimum of non-existent. Um, but yes, a lot of the attributes that Camila pointed out are very important. Uh, the data doesn't belong to the institution. And I think that's something that it also needs to be um, sensitized as we move along. Um, it's information that can uh, be shared with others, um, other ministries, other institutions, that's important. The principle of interoperability there is very important. Um, but obviously, it's, it's, it's public good, and as a public good, it could be um, taken um, by, you know, by, by anyone um, and uh, add value to, to that data. So those principles, um, we need to start grasping those, those principles, start working, start uh, changing culture, and I think that would, that, that, that would be um, ideal. Um, so cultural change is important. Uh, the national dialogue table, uh, the dialogues that we implemented in Costa Rica also supported on that cultural change um, and laying out the foundations of a lot of things that were showcased here by, by Camila in terms of um, the standards basically, the infrastructure um, that is not just a technological infrastructure that needs to be in place for opening data. Um, agree heavily. Uh, in, in, in what Camila said, uh, quality better uh, before quantity. Very important. I pointed out on the chat, a good example of that is Canada, uh, who in the beginning run uh, quickly to start opening data sets and open over 400,000 data sets um, that recently uh, downsized to uh, 80,000. 80,000 is still a lot of data sets. Uh, but think about 400,000 against 80,000 data sets published and available um, by the government of, um, of Canada. So they went through a process of spending a lot of money and resources, um, an effort in opening 400,000 data sets uh, to realize later that it was data that it was not being used and that one needed to be that, that it was costing also because um, the storage and, 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 and having it available was causing also a financial burden, it started downsizing and uh, prioritizing uh, based on usage. And that's what is important. So I think that's that's an attribute that is very important to, to grasp. And of course, uh, we hope that this project, and Henry Wade will cost, us on, uh, cost you all in the process of, uh, of implementation of this project in, 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 um, in different ways that the project can support um, in advancing in all those questions that you had uh, as a commitment of the project. And of course, this won't be only uh, a virtual encounter. We're going to be on site in, uh, in Belize City or Belmopan in Belize in general, as we had this uh, early this year with uh, Rodrigo Iriani from the Trust and, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, Henry uh, wait uh, on the ground. We're going to come back. We're uh, precisely programming all the activities that will take place inside, uh, on site, uh, additional training, national dialogue table, um, 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 and, and best practice exchange forum as well. Uh, that all combined will uh, produce specific products that we. Um, like to see as, as, as uh, proposals for the policy, for example, or the national strategy on open data or the infrastructure. Um, and of course, thinking about the projects that could be implemented down the road with this project, uh, with the seed money that this project will provide uh, to those ones who participate. So just saying all that to wrap up this, this session and, 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 and try to you know, provide a perspective to <laughs> everything that Camila uh, uh, spoke about here, and I want to thank you, Camila. I want to thank uh, the School of Data. I want to thank uh, Social Teak as well. Thank you for being engaged. Uh, I'm sure this will be uh, the first, not the last time that we uh, enjoy your your insights. Uh, we hope to see you connected to the rest of the project uh, somehow. We'll continue to to to, to make that happen. Uh, but thank you for for all the insights um, and for all the participants as well. Thank you. Uh, so Henry, uh, I'll leave it there, and uh, I, I want, I'll let you close uh, the session. 
Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, guys, as Mike said, um, there's some exciting uh, activities uh, pending and coming in, in, in the months ahead. Uh, we're excited about that. Uh, as you know, I like to share my, my contact information and um, our Facebook page. So please see that in the comment section below. Uh, again, Camila, thank you so much for uh, such an informative session. Um, also want to thank all our participants. Uh, I know we've had some who joined us a little bit late uh, today, uh, but that's still good. You guys decided to, to join us today. Um, and I also want to share that we're going to be sharing links to um, the attachments for the, the, the presentations provided previous emails you you should have uh, all three uh, presentations and the videos uh, we have uploaded those to YouTube uh, they're easily accessible yes thanks Mike uh, yes we'll be forwarding those uh, to the team and again guys uh, as I said please feel free to connect uh, to our Facebook page like our page share uh, your thoughts and comments and also feel free to share uh, the page with your friends. We're building an ecosystem here in Belize. We want to change mindsets. We want uh, open government. Um, we want open data here. Uh, so this is just the foundation. So we need all your help. We need all your support. Again, thanks to all our participants. Camila, thank you so, so much. And uh, if there are any questions, guys, uh, anything that maybe during the course of today or reviewing any of the, the sessions you come across, please feel free to email me. And we can then forward those to our experts uh, for their response. So again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Camila. If there's anything else you'd like to share, no, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. I hope the session was useful, and that I look forward to see how you implement these policies in Belize. So, if you had any questions, also I'm going to share my my email uh, on the chat. So feel free if something was left out of this talk and you're interested in, uh, in knowing and I can help you so thank you very much Mike and Henry so it's a pleasure and I hope that I could contribute with you in the future so good luck with uh, your projects and your open data policies over there thanks so much Camila so Mike I think we uh, close the session now uh, we'll be sharing the information via email with, with the team Thank you, Henry, also for moderating. Thank you all. Thank you to Cito, and I'll see you uh, next week with the final uh, two sessions. Final two sessions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And Camila shared her email. Thanks again, Camila. Have a wonderful day ahead, guys. Thank you all.